Excellent. What's up guys and welcome to Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A video where you guys ask questions and I answer them to the best of my abilities. All the questions for today's video were taken from last month's Probing Paul, so if you missed it, check it out. There is a playlist. Uh, we're on episode number 38 now. And of course there are many other Probing Pauls if you look back down this time hole here. So let's dive into it with the first question, which is from Ryan Ward who says, Hey Paul, love the channel. Here's my question. Is Ryzen optimized memory really that important over the sister dims in which there is no difference except AMD optimized? optimized in the title. Thanks and have a great day. This is a good question because Ryzen memory is important. You do want to have faster memory if you're building a Ryzen system because of the way Infinity Fabric works. Faster memory means an overall faster, better experience. And yes, there are plenty of kits like this one from G-Skill that have a little sticker on them that says compatible with Ryzen. And there are two ways to look at this. One way is to look at it as peace of mind that you can buy a kit that you can plug in and will work, which was more of an important factor when it came to Ryzen first and second gen because those platforms were very, very finicky with memory. So getting faster memory that you could plug in, load up the XMP values and just have a function was somewhat important and also something that people were willing to spend a few extra bucks on. That said, this kit, which is 3200 speed cast latency 14, if you got any other kit and plugged it into a Ryzen system and got it running at that speed and that latency, the performance would be exactly the same whether or not it has a compatible with Ryzen sticker on it. So to sum up, if you are very concerned about memory compatibility, then it might be worth your while to spend an extra five, 10, maybe 15 bucks on a Ryzen Ryzen compatible kit. If you want to save some money, especially if you're talking about Ryzen 3rd gen, which is supposed to be much more flexible with the memory it accepts, especially running at higher speeds, then you can double check your motherboard manufacturer's memory compatibility list. That will show memory kits that they have actually tested with your motherboard. And if you get one of those kits, it should work if the motherboard manufacturer has listed it for the rated speed. But then again, with the motherboard manufacturer's list, you might not have as wide a range of choices when it comes to the memory kits that are available. I would say just buy the kit that's fastest for your needs and then see if it works with your Ryzen build. If it doesn't work at the rated speeds, you should still be able to get it to work at entry level speeds. And then you can decide to swap that kit out for something that you know works in the future. Everything that AMD has told us about Ryzen 3000 memory compatibility has been that it's much more flexible and every kit that they plugged in and tested worked for them. So I know there were multiple answers to that question, but there's sort of different factors to take into account. All that said, I hope you're able to find a working fast kit of memory to use with your Ryzen build and you should have an easier your time if you're building a Ryzen 3000 system versus first or second gen. Next question is from ADS0608. He says, hey Paul, what GPU for 3440 by 1440? I'm assuming GTX 1070, uh, but looking to buy an ultra wide, can't decide if the GPU will be enough or if I need to upgrade to a 2070 S or 5700 XT as well. Now the two suggested video cards you have there are actually the ones I would point you towards. That said, you have a GTX 1070, which is a perfectly adequate card, still very powerful. The 10 series cards still have legs on them. So I would say buy your ultra wide monitor first, see what kind of performance you're getting out of your 1070. And then if you find it lacking in certain ways, then you could consider an upgrade. That said, if you're looking to upgrade right now, I'd recommend buying current gen parts rather than last gen parts, unless you can get an insane deal on a 1080 Ti or something like that, which is hard to find. The two cards I would point you to towards right now, if you're spending a little bit more money would be not this one, this is a 2080 super, but the 2070 super, which is like back up there in its box. 2070 super, I think is a good card you get a lot of performance for the money if you're able to spend around 500 bucks. That said, 500 bucks is a lot to spend for a lot of people. So if you want the poor people's ultra wide option, I would recommend the 5700 or the 5700 XT. Both very good cards, both still have the same amount of memory in them. Uh, so yeah, just, just choose either one of those. If you've got a little bit of extra money to spend, 350 bucks for the 5700 XT, probably the way to go. 5700, also very adequate card. Next question here from James Edwards. Hey Paul, have you ever considered building or assembling your own mechanical keyboard? Yes, I've considered it. No, I've never actually gone through with it. And that's partially because I have too many peripheral manufacturers who send me keyboards too often. And so me building my own is less of a concern for me because I have multiple mechanical keyboards to choose from. I'm also more of a function over form kind of, per kind of person. So if I have a mechanical keyboard and it's working and getting the job done for me, I don't always have like a huge desire to go in there and customize the keycaps and swap stuff around and whatever. I might do a little bit of dabbling with like some RGB software to make it match with the rest of the system or something like that. But I can certainly understand people who do want to take that extra time. It is like one of the main devices that you interact with a lot and especially customizing stuff to make it unique to you is a 
a pretty useful thing to do. That said, if you are interested in customized mechanical keyboards, and if you're not already aware, uh, there is a subreddit called r slash mechanical keyboards. I've dabbled in this uh, subreddit a few times, but you can actually find some really cool and unique examples of people who have built their own keyboards in different ways. So if you haven't visited there, I definitely would recommend checking it out. And I'll put a link to that down in the video's description. And shout out, of course, to the Mechanical Keyboard subreddit. Uh, I think you guys do great work over there. Next question is from Steven00, who says, what do you have planned for 2019? House project, PC projects, Ryzen? Uh, this question was asked last month. And in the interim, I have posted this video here, which is about uh, er, uh, upcoming projects. It was a massive unboxing video where I unboxed lots of stuff, but probably the most exciting one is the build I'm planning with the MSI Meg X570 Godlike motherboard, as well as two of their uh, 2080 Ti graphics cards, which are the Seahawk versions. I'll post a link to this video in the description as well. These are already water blocked with EK water blocks. I'm going to be using a Singularity PCs Spectre 2.0, so that's exciting. And then, yeah, there's a, there's a look at the graphics cards too. So that's probably the biggest upcoming PC project that I have in the works. Of course, of course, the HTPC project is also moving along and I, and I anticipate getting some more work done on that in the next week or two, so that's exciting. When it comes to house projects, so like for the past three years, I've tried to have one major project every year. Two years ago was refinancing our house and uh, switching from a 30 year to a 15 year mortgage, which I did and I'm still very proud of. Last year was the power wall and solar project and that's installed and working great. So this year I have been anticipating a big project, but we also had the big project, which is our baby being born, but now we're moving back towards like a major kind of renovation project. I have some exterior stuff as well as some interior stuff to be done. I will be documenting all of that as much as I can. But right now I'm actually in the talks with an architect to put plans together for everything. And then I'm gonna be reaching out to uh, find some contractors or some sub subcontractors. I'm gonna be working as the contractor and then I'm gonna be farming out several different projects to subcontractors. So anyone who does uh, roofing and construction, uh, hit me up uh, if, if you're in the Southern California area and you are repu reputable and do good work. I'll pay you good money for good work. It's like, I don't want a deal. I just want to give a reasonable amount of money to people to good work on my house. That's all I need. Anyway, when you're a homeowner and you're dealing with this stuff, it can be challenging from time to time. Lyndon Luther asks, hey, Paul, what do you consider the best antivirus to be? Which one do you use? Thanks. All right, so off the top of my head, first off, I don't typically run a third party antivirus software on most of my computers. If I were to suggest one off the top of my head, and this is with really minimal investment of time, and this is based on a friend's recommendation from years ago, so I hope it's still good. Uh, ESET Nod, I think is the one that uh, I would probably go with if I was investing in one. That said, I don't typically run antivirus besides the Windows Defender that's built in, and I keep that updated with Windows updates. If I ever have a situation where I feel like a computer has been compromised in any way, I'll typically go to Malwarebytes first of all and run that to, to find out if there's any malware or adware that the computer has become infected with. And then beyond that, I rely on uh, hopefully intelligent browsing methods when it comes to browsing the internet. There's a lot of stuff that becomes common sense if you've used the internet for a while, which isn't necessarily if you're just getting started. Next question here is from Rashid Saad. He says, hey Paul, did you realize you are not subscribed to Joe's channel? That's a good thing to point out. I uh, talked about Joe's YouTube channel last week. He's my editor. He also posts videos on YouTube. There he is. He has such great hair. Uh, all right. Subbed. I'm subbed to Joe now. You guys should too. Just a couple questions left. This one from Potato Potato. Uh, hey Paul, been watching your videos since the Newegg days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, love your videos. Keep it up. I will win float plane or float plane win. I want to throw my money at you. I appreciate the sentiment and everything, Potato Potato. Uh, and a bit of good news, I, I guess. Although honestly, I've said something like this before. So grain of salt and fingers crossed and everything. Uh, I am going to LTX this weekend. I'm going to talk to Luke a little bit about getting back into float plane or sort of kicking that back into gear because I was talking to them earlier this year and a bit last year about it and I just never got around to doing it. Um, but yeah, my intent still is to join Floatplane. So if you are looking for me to do that, hopefully it will happen soon. And maybe I'll follow up after this weekend uh, after I talk to Luke a little bit more about it and get some of those details worked out. Here's the last question for today from Dale Miller. Hey, Paul, your channel is great. Thank you, Dale. Uh, I get a lot of solid advice that you give. So I appreciate that. For me next month's Pro Me, Paul, I'd love to see more vids where you collaborate with Kyle or other tech YouTubers on projects. Do you have anything planned. So Dale, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I do a weekly live show, Tuesday evenings, Awesome Hardware with Kyle. So that's like my regular collaboration, but honestly, Kyle and I collaborate so often that I feel like I should branch out a little bit more than that. Uh, one person who I've talked to multiple times in the past year or so has been Jay, 
We've collaborated before, but it's been a while, so we'd like to get something done again. And we're also both pretty local here in Southern California, so I would like to move forward with that. Second thing is, as I already mentioned, I'm going to LTX this weekend, so I will hopefully be doing at least a vlog or maybe one or two little collaborative videos there, because I think Steve from Gamers Nexus and a bunch of other tech YouTubers go are going to be around, so it should be a good opportunity to do some on-site collaborations, but I will also hopefully talk to several of the people who are there about like future collaborations outside of just the weekend that we're there at LTX, because I know it's going to be a busy weekend with lots of people, fan meet and greets and all that kind of stuff, but yes, I would like to do more collaborations. YouTube recommends collaborations as often as possible to help grow your channel and your viewership and everything, so Dale, I will use this as a kick in the pants to re-attack that as a priority for the next month or two. And thank you for your question. One last thing to point out to you guys, if you're not aware, I have a PO box. There it is, Paul's Hardware PO Box 4325. I just like to plug this from time to time. If you guys wanna send me anything, feel free to do so. And we typically do a mail time segment every second or third show on Awesome Hardware on Tuesday evenings, where I open those packages and say, look what I got and, and say thank you to you who maybe has sent me something. Okay, I'm losing the ability to talk, so I should end this video. Thank you so much for watching. Hit the thumbs up button. And of course, uh, if you want me to ask questions to be answered next month, do those in the comment section down below. Thanks again for watching guys, and we'll see you next time.